Welcome to today's lecture. Um, we stopped last week with uh, the different types of cards. As I've just mentioned, I'll be using a couple of German slides uh, until we get to the types of loans, um, because uh, what follows is mostly concerned about German law and uh, some peculiarities of German law. Um, this is, I guess, straightforward. Um, you probably all know that by now there are different types of uh, electronic cards. Um, the, you can start actually by loyalty cards at shopping stores. Um, for example, uh, Karstadt, Kaufhof, Saturn, Mediamarkt, uh, all um, um, supermarket stores and uh, supermarket chains uh, nowadays have uh, loyalty cards. And usually they also give you some type of credit um, because most of these companies are interested in getting your uh, data. Um, you have credit cards, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, etc. Um, you have uh, Maestro banking cards in the European Union at least. Uh, these are regular uh, debit cards uh, for your bank account. Uh, in other countries you probably have other uh, bank cards with other names, but in the European Union we uh, usually have Maestro, uh, the former EC cards, Eurocheck cards, and we have uh, um, what we call in German Geldkarte, money cards. Um, there's a slight difference between your bank debit card and uh, a Geldkarte, a money card, which is um, that um, you do not legally, you do not um, allow a company to withdraw money and to transfer money from your bank account, but you transfer a certain amount of money to your money card and if it's lost, it's lost. If your uh, debit card is lost, uh, someone else still needs to, um, um, to, to start the money transfer and if you are quick enough and notify your bank, um, no one is able to use your bank debit card, but it's different with a Geld card or the money card. Um, is the difference clear to you? Uh, this money card, this Geld card is really electronic cash. It's totally anonymous. It's loaded and uploaded uh, to your bank card. And you can use it, for example, I think, in, uh, you can use it at some, or you used to use, uh, be able to use it at some stores and also at um, uh, cigarette uh, vending machines. I guess it's becoming less and less important because nowadays people uh, are starting to use PayPal and other uh, money transfer services more often. Mm? Okay, so these are different types of uh, bank cards. Um, and what this has, in, has encompassed, or is encompassed with this is that, of course, customers are changing their behavior and uh, customers change the way they pay for services and goods. Nowadays, you see people paying with a PayPal account. You see people um, usually, at least in Europe, paying uh, with less and less cash and more with electronic cards and this will change even more with fintech starting um, to um, enter the market and trying to get more customers and uh, draw customers away from traditional banks uh, to their services. Okay. Now, after having talked a lot about the deposit taking side of uh, the banking business, we want to talk about the credit and loan business. And as I've said, I will start with some legal definitions, and these, are, uh, these come from German law. Um, we have a distinction in German law, under German law, between what we call a Geldleihe and Kreditleihe, which means giving credit and giving a loan, giving out a loan. Uh, the difference is that uh, in the one uh, variant, uh, you give money to someone else and you loan him or her some money. In the other variant, you simply tell him that he can withdraw money and that he can get money from you if it's needed. Um, in German, we call this Geldleihe and Kreditleihe. So in case you give out money, it's, it's a traditional loan. Um, this is what we call a Geldleihe. Um, 
in case you simply tell someone, yes, I would be willing to give out a loan, I would be willing to act as a lender, uh, you give credit. And there's a fine distinction between the two. And this is called Geldleihen, Kreditleihen, a German law. Um, to be able uh, to get a loan or to get credit, uh, you need to be credit worthy. And this is the day-to-day -day and daily business of every bank. They will try to assess your credit worthiness and they will use some form of rating uh, or credit scoring um, to evaluate um, the probability that you will be able to pay back the loan. This is what banks uh, do every day and uh, how this works is that usually um, a customer will come to you as a bank, he will request a loan and you will request um, um, the disclosure of certain information. You will ask uh, what income do you have, do you have any assets, um, do you um, what do you need? How much money do you need? Uh, for how long uh, do you want to loan, uh, to, um, uh, to lend the money? Um, and this information will be aggregated and the bank will use this aggregated data in some form of rating or scoring to assess the probability that the customer will be able to pay back the loan. Um, what uh, other information will be um, uh, written down in the contract. Usually you will have um, the loan sum, uh, the maturity, uh, the length and the duration of the uh, loan contract, interest rates of course will be fixed in the contracts, contract and other additional costs. Now this is interesting because um, there was um, a ruling only a couple of years ago. Does anyone know from Germany what uh, uh, ruling we have, I think, from the Supreme Constitutional Court, Bundesverfassungsgericht. Uh, might also be uh, the Big EH. I'm not so sure. Um, until a couple of years ago, banks were allowed uh, to charge a fee for mortgage loans upfront with no real. Uh, service in exchange. They had uh, what in German we call Bearbeitungs, Bereitstellungs, uh, Bereitstellungsgebühr, the cost of uh, making the credit available and uh, one of our highest courts in Germany ruled that this is not legal and banks were forced to pay back uh, these uh, costs and these administrative costs uh, for all loans dating back, uh, I think, at least 10, 15 years. So suddenly all banks were forced to pay back administrative uh, costs. Um, so you cannot charge any type of cost. Um, there are some things you can charge, but uh, you cannot simply say, okay, I'm giving you 100,000 euros uh, of loan, a uh, uh, loan of 100,000 euros, and I will immediately charge you 500 euros just for putting the money into a bank account at my own bank. So this is illegal, in Germany at least. Um, you will fix the details uh, on how the money uh, has to be paid back. Um, there might also be some uh, covenants. Um, you might also uh, use uh, some collaterals. For example, if you are a business, if you have uh, some uh, assets you can use as collateral, then you will fix these collaterals in your loan contract. And of course, there are sometimes um, some ways um, in which you can um, terminate the contract before uh, maturity. Uh, do you know, for example, uh, when it comes to mortgage loans, what a frequent reason and one legal reason is uh, to, uh, to uh, terminate the contract. Imagine you buy a house or you buy a flat. Uh, can, you, can you terminate the contract without the consent of the bank? If you enter a loan contract, do you think you can just terminate the contract prematurely? No. If you buy a flat, if you buy a house, and you agree to a loan contract that will run over 20 years, you're stuck. 
you cannot simply exit the contract with a bank because then you would be in breach of the contract. But there is one important uh, exit option you have. No. If you pay back all uh, the money uh, in a lump sum, the bank will probably charge you a lot uh, of the interest. Well, you can do this, of course. The bank will be very happy, but this is not really an option. Another reason why, um, why you can legally exit such a contract without the consent of the bank if you sell the property. If you sell the house, if you sell the flat and you have a loan mortgage on it, um, this is one, one option you have uh, in which you can, you can use the proceeds from the sale and you can repay the loan without having to pay back all the future interest rate um, you would have to pay to the bank. This makes sense because the basis for your loan contract has vanished. You've bought a house, you've sold the house, and then, of course, you have a lot of money, uh, you have uh, high proceeds from the sale, and then you are allowed to exit the contract with the bank without having to pay an enormous amount of money of future interest you would otherwise uh, have to pay to the bank. Hmm? It's close to what we call Wegfall der Geschäftsgrundlage in German, under German law. If you have a contract, and it's based on some other legal uh, contract and some other basis uh, and the basis of some other legal uh, relation between two parties and this basis uh, suddenly vanishes uh, it might be that a second contract that is based on this first one is also void just uh, because in this case you're no longer the owner of the property and why would you have to pay a loan on it yeah That's a good question. Uh, I would assume. I would assume this applies to businesses as well, but I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. I only know this is true for uh, private loans. You know? And I would assume there shouldn't be. Why should there be a distinction for businesses? Because I think the basis for the loan, it only applies. By the way, it only applies to uh, mortgage loans because. There, of course, you have a property. The property is used, regularly used as collateral, um, and this, this also makes sense for businesses. If they sell the property, they should have an option to, to opt out of the contract. Yeah. OK, collaterals, um, ways to terminate the contract prematurely, and everything else that bank and customer agree upon and um, the general, the general business conditions, allgemeine, uh, the allgemeine Geschäftsbedingungen, the AGBs. Um, these are the regular bylaws of a company they put uh, in every contract. And this might also be existent in the legal systems you come from. In under German law, um, you can the standard clauses and the standard conditions under which a business um, operates can be included in a set of bylaws that is given to you as a customer with each contract. And these, this is what we call in German the Allgemeine Geschäftsbedingungen, the general business conditions. Uh, this just means that these are legal clauses that are part of every contract um, that the company has set once and they only include it in this general set of legal clauses, but they do not explicitly e include it in each and every contract. And these legal clauses, these general legal clauses, have to um, fulfill certain requirements. Otherwise, they are um, illegal and they are void. And, uh, of course, each bank has such a set of legal clauses. Okay. The question, uh, who can get a loan? Uh, is under German law is actually quite tricky. Um, to be able to get a loan, to get credit, um, you need to be able to sign a legal contract. And this is, I know this is uh, quite tricky, 
Um, I guess it's the same in, in the legal systems where you, uh, from which you come from. Um, in Germany, um, for customers, for private customers, and for natural persons, um, you need to be, uh, yeah, rechtsfähig, nice German word, um, you need to be um, able to uh, participate in legal business, which usually means uh, you get, a natural person has this ability uh, by birth, uh, starting with birth, and you need to be able to legally participate in business transactions. And this is usually uh, when you get 18. Um, there are some cases where, um, this is a more tricky question, but banks usually will require people to be 18 uh, to enter a loan contract. Uh, why, is there, why is this important for lawyers? Um, it might be, uh, for example, if I, if I donate 500 euros to you, I can donate 500 euros to a child and this child can accept this money. This child cannot enter a loan contract, but it, enter, it can enter a legal uh, relation with me if it's, for example, it's a donation, if it can only profit from this legal transaction, from this legal contract. So a donation is no problem, but as soon as there is some obligation to a child, the child cannot legally enter a contract. So this is why uh, you have to make sure that, for example, someone who is 17 or 16 can enter a certain type of legal contract. Same thing is with, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, an allowance. Um, if you have a child of 10 or 12 or 15 years, you can give your child 10 euros and tell him, go buy some snacks. Yeah? If he enters a shop and he buys some snacks, of course, this is allowed under German law because this is uh, uh, a special case where you give a child an allowance, but usually a child would not be able to enter a legal contract. So there are some exceptions under, legal, uh, under German law where... Um, a child can enter, uh, legally enter a contract, but a loan contract will usually, in most cases, require uh, that you are 18. It's a little bit different for companies. Uh, companies uh, and Körperschaften, uh, these are public, public companies usually. Uh, public companies and private companies can enter loans if they are organized, if they are um, operating in the legal form of, a, um, of these two legal entities, uh, often Handelsgesellschaft and Kommanditgesellschaft. Those are uh, legal entities and legal forms under German law who only require a couple of persons to form um, a business. Um, it's not a corporation. They are not incorporated. Uh, but this is close to, I think... Uh, a partnership under UK and under Ang Anglo-American law. So if you are in a partnership, you can enter a loan contract. Um, or in some other cases, uh, if you are incorporated, if you are a corporation, of course, you can also enter a loan contract. <coughs> How can loan contracts be terminated if you repay your loan sum? either at maturity or in some cases you will also uh, pay back the money beforehand but in most of these cases you will have to pay the interest rates anyway so why should you repay the loan before maturity in some cases um, the contract expires and this is not the same as repaying your loan um, can you give me an example for example, where a loan contract will expire before having repaid all the loan sum, all of the loan sum. Actually, I entered such a contract. I bought a flat. Uh, I agreed on, uh, I think, 10 years uh, of, uh, of a duration of 10 years for my loan contract, for my mortgage loan. And what will happen after the contract expires? I will still have some money to pay back after 10 years. Uh, what will happen then? The bank will say, OK, are you able to repay 50,000 euros now? Or we will do what? We will simply make a new contract. 
with new interest rate conditions. And we will enter a second contract, which will be almost the same as the first one, but of course the bank will be able to adjust the interest rate. And this is one reason why, for example, I of course wanted a loan contract, a mortgage loan, with a very long duration and a long maturity, because I will not get a better interest rate than I'm getting right now. So in 10 years, I will probably uh, get a higher, I have to pay a higher interest rate on my mortgage loan. You can also agree on 20 years, so this is often done. Or you can terminate the contract. Um, how can you terminate the contract? The first reason, um, in German, under German law, we have two ways to terminate a contract. In an ordinary fashion or extraordinarily. What is an ordinary termination? This applies to all types of contract. For example, if I employ one of you as uh, I am a company and I empl employ someone of you as a worker, I can terminate the contract in a, an ordinary way or in an extraordinary fashion. And what could be some reasons uh, for you to terminate or for me to terminate the employment in an extraordinary fashion if you steal. If I, if I do an ordinary termination, I usually have a statute of limitations. I can only, um, I can only terminate the contract and I have to, for example, I have to notify you and I need to wait three months, usually. Mm -hmm. I have to wait three months. Same applies to a uh, um, flat rent contract. If uh, you rent a flat, um, you can terminate the contract in Germany um, and have to wait for, I think, three months. And then you can exit the contract. If you suddenly set fire to the house, I can throw you out immediately. So this is the distinction between an ordinary termination and an extraordinary termination. The same applies to loan contracts. If the bank has some reason to believe that you are not fulfilling the obligations from the contract, and if you're doing something illegally, it can, of course, immediately terminate the loan contract and try to uh, get its money back from you. You can also terminate the contract, and there are some extraordinary reasons. It doesn't Usually, it doesn't have to be illegal. There are some ways you can extraordinarily terminate a loan contract. For example, in case of a mortgage loan, if you sell the property. This is, this is a special reason why you can terminate the loan contract. Okay. This is actually here. If it's a, usually, it's a case of a mortgage loan. Okay. Also, of course, if you as a customer give wrong information, if you are in breach of the contract and you have given false information to the bank, it can also uh, terminate the contract. Okay. Then let's go to collaterals. And this, this is why I'm using the German slides. It doesn't make too much sense to translate the, all of this into English. And as I've said, the, the current translation is still not quite satisfactory. Um, you can use two types of collateral. You can use um, um, persons, uh, natural persons can vouch for you. And you can use assets as collateral. The first one we call Personensicherheiten. Sicherheit is just security. Um, and you can use uh, people vouching for you. And you can use assets as collateral. These are Sachsicherheit. And uh, the important question now is, what type, uh, what type of guarantee is a person giving you as a bank? And what types of assets are you using as collateral? And are these assets transferred to the bank or not? So you will get different types of collaterals and collateral agreements. And this is what a Bürgschaft guarantee Etc. is. Uh, let's start with people vouching for you and people giving personal guarantees. Um, Bürgschaft in German, it's a situation in which someone else 
a third person um, agrees and vouches for the obligations and uh, duties um, of a lender. So for example, if I'm a bank and you get a loan from me, someone else, someone of you would, could vouch for him and agree that if the lender defaults, no, if the, um, ah, if, uh, the creditor defaults, if the customer defaults, uh, the person vouching for him will have to step in and he or she will have to pay the money to the bank. This is what we call a bookshop. This is just a personal guarantee. Um, there is also a fine legal distinction between an ordinary uh, guarantee and what we call selbstschuldnerisch. And I don't know if there's an English word for that. The distinction between the two now is that um, it makes a difference whether I, as a bank, have, uh, I have to wait for my customer to default, for the third person to step in, or if I could simply uh, go to the person who has vouched for my customer. So in the first scenario, this is the ordinary guarantee, I will have to wait as a bank, I will have to wait for the customer to default and then go to the third person. In the second uh, variant, I will immediately go. If I see, okay, he's having problems, he might not pay back its, uh, his or le her loan. I will, I will not wait for him to default. I will simply ask the third person who has guaranteed for him and who has vouched for him, I will simply ask him, okay, you now need to, have to, uh, need to step in and you now need to pay back the loan he owns me, he owes me. Okay. And the third variant is a simple guarantee. Um, this is a case where someone else guarantees to pay back a certain amount of money. As you can see, these are more or less the same types of personal guarantees and some other third person vouching for you. Um, under German law, it's a fine distinction whether the bank has to wait or if the bank can immediately go to the third person. Okay. And this guarantee is not regulated. It's not formally part of our legal system. Usually, these personal guarantees, um, they become void. No. Um, they do not become void in case uh, the loan is paid back. So in some cases, the bank might still use this guarantee for the next loan or for a different loan. And this is important because um, if, for example, this is a company, I'm a bank, and we have five loan contracts. The question now is, is the guarantee attached to just one loan contract? or is it attached to the customer? And usually what will happen is that someone else guarantees for all the loan contracts and all the debts of this one customer to the bank and the guarantees are attached to the customer and they are not attached to one specific loan. Because otherwise uh, the person could just say, okay, I will pay back this loan, I have a guarantee um, from someone else for this loan, but after having paid back this loan, I will default on the next one. And this cannot happen. This is not legal in Germany. Um, yeah. Um, this one is more or less the same, Schuld mit Übernahme. The last one, Patronatserklärung. This is uh, a special case in which um, a holding company guarantees to pay back the debt of its uh, affiliate subsidiaries. So this is the special case in which you have a holding company and some subsidiaries and of course the holding company is also liable uh, and has to pay back the loans of the subsidiaries. And you cannot simply 
make your subsidiaries default and keep the money in the holding. Okay. So these are personal guarantees. Now let's go to um, the asset collaterals. As I've said before, um, it's usually the same. You take and you use some assets you have as usually as a company or when it comes to loan mortgages as um, as a private person, you use assets as collateral and these assets can be used by the bank if you default on your loan and the bank will sell off the assets to use uh, to get its money back from the customer. This is a asset collateral. Now, everything else that now comes on these slides um, is the legal fine print in German law, um, how this actually works. And again, there are some some small details when it comes to these collaterals. Um, why? Because in some cases, um, it, uh, several assets are summarized. Um, you also have uh, what we call an open cessation uh, or a, a clandestine uh, cessation of assets and use of as collateral. And why is there a distinction between an open cessation of assets or a clandestine one? How does it work? Again, I'm a bank. Uh, now, you are the customer. You want a loan. Okay. You are the uh, customer. You want a loan. And you use, um, well, what can you do? Um, um, you can use um, some claims you have against other companies as an asset collateral. And um, what is the difference between an open use of an asset as a collateral and a clandestine, or a hidden use? Any idea? Why, why would someone not disclose the fact that an asset is being used as uh, collateral. Why, why should there be, or could there be a distinction between these two? A disclosed and an undisclosed one. No idea? Okay. First, let's start Again, with the basics. Um, first, you can make a distinction between using assets as collaterals, and you can also use claims as collateral. Banks will usually be interested in cash claims. So for example, if you are a company and you still expect payments from your own customers, I'm not interested, as a bank, I'm not interested in your cars. I'm not interested in your, in your company factories because I will not be able to sell these. I'm interested in something more liquid. And usually these are claims against customers. So I will use these as a collateral. I will force you to use these as a collateral and I will not be interested, as I said, in your company cars because they are worthless anyway. And I would simply be um, ending up with uh, some cars on my uh, on my bank parking space. So I will not be interested in this. This is the difference between uh, Forderung claims and some asset rights and property rights. And I will usually be interested in getting uh, and using claims and cash claims and more liquid assets as uh, collateral. So what will happen? Same scenario. Let's assume that you are a company, or you. Uh, no one's looking, it's OK. Uh, someone of you is a company. And you still expect uh, payments from your own customers. And you want to get a loan from me as a bank. Now, I will ask you to hand over these claims and uh, these rights as a collateral. 
Now, what is the difference between an open cessation and an undisclosed or clandestine cessation? It's, yeah? Yeah, in an open uh, cessation, you have to tell the old customer of yours yeah. that uh, uh, yeah, he has to pay the two, two yeah. personal. You now have to pay back your money to the bank. In the other scenario, your own customers will pay back the money to you and you will be forced and required to pay this money to the bank directly. So this is the fine print. So you can either disclose it to your own customers who owe you money or you cannot disclose it and you will have to be uh, the one paying the money to the bank. This is the difference between what we call in German stille Session and offene Session. Okay. Next uh, detail. In some cases, um, your claims and your rights and your assets um, can be transferred one by one. And this is actually what is usually required under German law. Um, you cannot, you cannot, uh, if you start from scratch, um, you cannot simply say, I, can tr I transfer all of these rights to you. You need a special contract for that. And this is uh, what is described here below. For example, a global cessation. Um, this is the case, for example, let's assume you, someone of you is, uh, is a car manufacturer and you have many claims against customers. And each uh, with 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros, 5,000 euros. And you cannot go to a bank and say, I need 1 million euro of uh, loan contract, uh, of a loan sum, and uh, tell, I can give you the rights to one claim against one of my customers um, with 1,000 euros. The bank will usually tell you, okay, we need at least 500,000 euros as collateral. So the normal way would be to make a bunch of contracts to draw up hundreds of contracts and to transfer the property rights of each and every one of these claims. Now, this is not very practical. So what you can do is you can do what in German we call a session or global session, so a global cessation, and you simply draw up a contract and tell the bank, I hereby transfer all the property rights as collateral to say all the contracts uh, and all the claims I have to, against customers with starting name A to B. So it's clearly defined which contracts are and which property rights are transferred to the bank as collateral. But legally speaking, it's not really exact. If you suddenly have a new customer, uh, usually you will need to draw up a new contract to transfer the property rights, but this is healed by such a global cessation. Is that clear? Legally speaking, for each transfer, you need one contract. You cannot simply tell someone, I am transferring all of these rights. And if some new uh, property rights come to me, uh, they are also transferred. It needs to be exact, to be legally binding. So what one can do is to draw up a, a contract in which all these contracts are specified exactly, and then they are all transferred. And yeah. For example, this is global cessation, global cession. For example, all the rights and all claims for customers starting from A, A to H are transferred. Yeah? Okay. Also, legal fine print. One distinction between the two is the question at which moment is the property right transferred to the bank? In the one scenario, it's transferred if you give a list of claims to the bank. In the other scenario, these property rights are immediately transferred to the bank in the moment in which the claim and the property right uh, becomes into, uh, comes to life. For example, if you sell a car and you own money to the car manufacturer, it might be that this claim is immediately transferred to the bank. In the first scenario, it's only transferred when the, the car manufacturer 
uh, pulls up a list of claims and hands it over to the bank. Okay. Also quite interesting, if these claims are transferred to another bank, usually a bank will have uh, uh, a clause in its contract, its general business uh, clauses, that they can opt out for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is also possible. It is also possible not only to use an asset as a collateral, but it's also sometimes possible and done by banks to transfer the property rights itself. Um, I have to be precise. All these collateral and uses as collateral, um, what we call Sicherungsabtretung, um, this is um, you simply allow the bank to use this in case uh, the customer defaults. But it's still owned by the customer. And there is one more um, harsh way uh, to transfer uh, some assets as collateral, what we call uh, the property rights uh, transaction or Sicherungsübereignung. It's, it's the legal act of transferring the property rights uh, from one party to another. So in this case, you do not only, as a bank, you will not only get the right to use um, this asset as collateral, but you own it. You are now the official owner of this asset, and you can allow the customer to continue using it. Fine difference. Why? If the company defaults, um, you have a weaker claim as a bank. You have a weaker claim against uh, the company to use this asset if you have only the right to use it as a collateral. If the company, if the customer has already transferred the property rights, you are in the clear. As a bank, you now own it and you have already owned it. And if the company defaults, you are in the clear. No one else can take it away from you. So it, it only gets interesting in the case the customer defaults, then suddenly all the creditors will uh, uh, they will struggle to get their money back. And then it's uh, a question how strong your claim is against the customer relative to all the claims of the different and remaining creditors. Huh? Okay. So this is the transfer of the property rights. And this is, for example, usually done with cars. Um, so you will transfer the property rights of the cars to the bank and the company is still able to, is still allowed to use um, the car. Um, another question. I'm not. Uh, this goes out to the uh, exchange students. Do you have a, a broad understanding of how property rights work under German private law? This is you. You all are you all from? Uh, well, probably not. If you are from France. Uh, it's probably the same, I would assume, because we've adopted uh, the French private law uh, and the Code Civil and Code Napoleon. But for, especially for people from uh, England and the US, it's completely different. Because under German private law, we have a, uh, a distinct, a clear distinction between property rights and uh, ownership, Besitz und Eigentum. For example, I am the owner and I'm, I also have the property rights for this pen. But I could give you this pen and then you would be the owner, uh, der Besitzer. Uh, you would currently be in possession of the pen, but I would still be uh, the owner and I would still have the property rights. And in this case, I can demand uh, from you to give me my property back. So this is why we uh, here we have uh, this uh, legal act of transferring property it's only um, one could say the property rights are immaterial and possession is of course the material possession of an object so you could be 
in the possession of an object, but you probably could not, you're probably not the owner. Okay. Fundrecht. Also very nice. Um, now we have transferred property rights and uh, this is the right uh, to exploit the proceeds uh, and to sell off a certain assets that has been given to you as a collateral. So this is Fundrecht in German. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's nothing more here to say about Fundrecht, the right to sell off assets. It's, as I said, a fine legal distinction, but in the end, it's the same result. Um, you are able to sell off assets and uh, you can use these. I think it's more relevant for um, securities that are used as collateral. Because in most cases, uh, for example, a bank will not really use a car. It will not sell off cars and uh, other machines or properties. It's different uh, with securities because securities are extremely liquid and they can be easily sold off uh, on the market. Um, same with the gold uh, and other things. Uh, yeah, this is one way to do this. Um, loan mortgages uh, and a mortgage um, is, of course, special to um, real estate properties. Uh, it can be done to um, uh, real estate spaces and also buildings. And um, there is, again, uh, a fine distinction between two uh, legal transactions. In German, we call it Hypothek and Grundschule. They are both mortgages. Um, and this is... The distinction is, and the difference is, that uh, one of these types of mortgages is attached um, um, to um, the existence of a claim of the bank and the other one isn't. And why is this important? I can give you an example. Usually, um, banks will do something uh, which we call a Grundschuld uh, and not a, not a traditional mortgage. Does uh, anyone from the German students know why usually we have a Grundschuld in German? Why banks will use a loan that is not attached to the, uh, they will use a mortgage that is not attached to the loan. It's actually quite practical. So this mortgage collateral, this mortgage, it's on a house. For example, I buy a house. I agree on a mortgage loan and the mortgage is atta not attached to the house. It's not, well, no, it's attached to the house, but it's not attached to this particular loan contract. Why? Because under German law, if you um, agree on a mortgage, it has to be uh, done in front of a notary, by notar, um, by a public notary, and you have to pay a fee for that. So um, in Germany, um, you might know that we have lawyers, Rechtsanwälte. Uh, we do not have a distinction between barristers and solicitors. We only have lawyers. If you pass the bar exam, you're allowed to practice as a lawyer in Germany. And uh, from state to state, we have notaries, notare. These are lawyers who have changed a little bit their profession. They usually in some federal states, for example here in Saxony, they will stop working as a lawyer and they will work as a notary, which means that they are, um, that, uh, they are um, allowed by the state to uh, act as a witness to certain types of contracts and they will 
um, co-sign certain contracts for which the state and the, the German government says that this needs to be done in front of a neutral third person party. And this is a notary. For example, if you buy real estate, this has to be done in front of a notary. Uh, do you know what, el what kind of contracts also need to be done um, by a notary? Um, documentation for public offerings? Public offerings, yes. Even more practical. Yeah? Starting a business? Starting business, yes. More practical when it comes to your private life. Uh, wedding papers, no. That needs to be done in front of the state, but not in front of a notary, I think. If, for example, you apply a testament, needs to be done. You cannot simply draw... A, well, you can do this, but it will have more power if you do it in front of a notary. And you can place it with a notary, and in case you die, the notary will be notified, and he will notify... Um, he will notify the ass. And you've seen this in, on TV, I guess, that there is someone, in some other countries it's a regular lawyer, in this case, in Germany it's a notary. Um, testaments, uh, starting a business, and real estate sales. Everything that is connected with buying or selling real estate needs to be done uh, and needs to be co-signed by a notary. And now, the distinction here between a mortgage that is attached to the loan and one that is only attached to the property is that if your loan expires, you would have to go to a notary and again pay the fee to draw up a new contract because the bank will, of course, say, we need some collateral. Now, the loan contract has expired after 10 years. We have no collateral because the collateral was attached to the loan. But we want, well, of course, you as uh, the buyer, as uh, the owner of the property, you have to, uh, to pay the fee. So you will ask the bank to do a mortgage and to accept a mortgage as a collateral that is only attached to the property. And this is actually something that happened to my parents. They bought a house. 25 years later, the loan was paid back and they still have the mortgage on their house because they said, at some case, we might want to take another loan and we don't want to spend 1,000 euros again on a notary. And we can simply tell the bank has uh, given out uh, the contract and the mortgage um, um, contract details and the official document, they have sent it back to my parents. They now keep it, I don't know where, I hope they know it. And if they want to get another loan, they can simply use the old mortgage that is attached to the property. This is the difference here between a Grundschuld and a mortgage, a hypothek. And banks will regularly do a mortgage that is attached to the property and not to the loan. It would only um, only produce costs. Okay. Then, in addition to collateral assets, a bank will usually, especially when it comes to business to business contracts and business customers, they will try to um, force covenants into the contract. What are covenants? Covenants are additional agreements in the contract. Um, that require one party or the other to disclose some kind of information or to stick to some kind of behavior. Usually the bank will require the customer to refrain from certain actions. They will ask and require the customer to disclose certain information. For example, I could ask you, if you are a company, I could uh, force you to send me your business um, balance sheet um, figures on a regular basis. I could also agree, we could also agree on some kind of financial covenant or event, event risk covenant that uh, mandates that if you, as a company, have a bad year, if, you, if your balance sheet figures are bad, uh, the bank can withdraw from the contract, it can terminate the contract, or it can increase interest rates, for example. So these are, uh, these are covenants. These are additional legal clauses, contract clauses, and additional agreements that both parties accept 
Usually, of course, the bank will ask the company to accept these covenants. And if the customer does not accept this co uh, a covenant, the bank will not agree to a loan contract. So the bank has some leverage over the customer because the customer is the one who needs the money. And these are affirmative covenants, financial covenants, event risk covenants, and usually they will require the disclosure of some kind of information or it will ask the company to do something or to refrain from doing something. For example, do you have any examples of what the company could do or could be asked not to do? Simplest covenant. If you're a company and you need 1 million euros and you tell me that you want to buy a machine. I could insert a covenant telling you if you do not buy this machine, I want my money back. This is an affirmative covenant that means that you need to do this. You need to buy this machine. Do, do you know an example for uh, an, a covenant that asks you to refrain from a certain action. Simplest example, don't pay out dividends. If you are not able to repay your loan, don't pay out dividends. Don't increase executive compensation. Don't give out money to some other stakeholders if it's legal. You can enter a negative pledge, which means that um, the customer is not allowed to use certain assets as collateral. Um, a clause, a covenant that requires the customer uh, to treat the bank equally as any other lender. For example, if you are the last bank to give out a loan to a customer, it might be that you are the one who will get back no will get back none of his money. It might also be that you are in advantage over some other lenders. And this cause, clause and this covenant uh, makes sure that uh, all the lenders are treated equally. Cross default clause. This allows uh, the lender um, to terminate the loan contract in case um, the um, another com company is close to default. This might make sense, for example, if you assume that you're a bank, you have given a loan to a supplier uh, of a car manufacturer, and the car manufacturer is close to default. You can be sure that the supplier, the, the supplier will also get problems if the car manufacturer, uh, the, major, the major customer, uh, defaults. So it's only a question of time when this cross default will hit you. So a cross default clause makes sure that as a bank you can terminate the contract prematurely in case someone else in a different company is close to default. Okay, owner maintenance clause allows the bank to terminate the contract in case um, the ownership changes of the customer. Disposal of asset clause um, prohibits the customer to sell off certain assets. If the company is not allowed to sell off, for example, a major inventory or major machines. Dividend restriction, we already had that. And we also might use covenants to force certain investments or to prohibit the company to engage in certain investment projects. Some other examples for financial covenants, equity ratio covenants, uh, return ratios, cash flow ratios. You can use any type of ratio and try to include it in a covenant, in a financial covenant. Um, do you think there are any restrictions on covenants? 
Are there any ratios prohibited from being used in a covenant? Of course not. It's free market. Especially in this case, usually these covenants are agreed upon between a bank and a business customer, uh, a commercial customer, for example, a company. And there is no reason why the state should interfere in this, and why the state uh, should force and prohibit certain uh, ratios. If you as a bank, as a customer, agree on a covenant that includes uh, some crazy ratio uh, from your balance sheet, well, you're free to do so. It's a, free, it's a free economy. If both parties agree on a financial covenant, then that's the way it goes. Okay, so these are loans and loan securities and collaterals and covenants. This has been researched a lot, especially covenants, because um, as I've probably told you a couple of times, especially when it comes to research, uh, banking is interesting for economists for two reasons. First, because banks, if they go down south, they can destabilize the whole financial system and banks can have an impact on the general economy uh, due to its importance for transaction services. And the second reason why banks are interesting to economists is because they give out loans to companies, companies use loans to invest, and investments will usually create jobs and spur economic growth. So, um, especially B2B loans are of quite interest to economists and to central banks. And this is why financial covenants have been researched a lot, because they are a regular instrument for banks to control the probability of default. Because uh, in the end, the bank wants to manage its loan defaults. It wants to decrease the probability that a company defaults or is not able to pay back its loan. And in case the loan defaults, the bank, of course, is interested in having a high recovery rate. Um, what do you think? If a company defaults, what can you recover from such a loan? How much percent of the loan sum is lost, usually? Yeah? An average figure? Average. I think it depends on the type of loan. Yeah, but what would you expect? In total fail, nothing. You get nothing back. But in case of very yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting to see that the recovery rate, that is the money that can still be recovered from a defaulted loan, is actually on average 10 to sometimes 20, 30 percent. How do you do this? How can you recover money from a loan that has already been in default? When a company goes bankrupt, they have the, um, the German word, someone who's regulating or handling the bankruptcy. Yeah. You have bankruptcy proceedings. Um, a company will, for example, in the US, file bankruptcy under Chapter 11. And this, of course, m does not mean that all is lost. And you can still try to sell off the assets. You can try to continue the business. And in most cases, not 100% of a loan is lost, but you are still able to recover 10, 20%. But this also means that these covenants are, of course, first meant to reduce the, pro um, the uh, default probability, but they are also meant to increase the recovery rate. And this is interesting because this is something uh, where banks can actually earn a buck. They can do a good risk management and they can try to minimize the losses from uh, defaulting loans. And this has been researched a lot because the question now is, what, what works best? A financial covenant, uh, a pledge clause, or um, equity clause, or a dividend payout clause? Uh, I, I don't know the results of this literature. This is not, not actually my field of research, but uh, I know there exist a lot of studies on the, on the benefits and also the adverse effects of 
um, financial covenants because of course if a company the company will know what covenants it has agreed upon uh, agreed to and the company can counteract it can try to circumvent uh, the intended effects of the covenant and if you have a company who defaults perhaps it also is uh, the management is doing something illegal um, and it's uh, a bankruptcy, uh, it might be that the covenants do not work at all. But still, uh, there are some covenants that work better than some others. Okay. So next, uh, let's go to the different types of loans. Um, we can uh, distinguish between corporate and sovereign clients and private customers and usually we distinguish between short-term and medium and long-term. Short-term is usually everything that runs up to 12 months of duration. Medium is one to five years and long-term everything above five years of duration. We have certain all different types of loans in Germany. We have uh, uh, account overdraft, we have a securities loan, a credit card, credit loan, we have consumer credits, something we call in German Realdarlehen, which is a real, uh, yeah, we'll see about that, a building society loan, uh, we have euro credit loans, uh, communal loans, these are very large loans to uh, municipalities, um, sometimes uh, a, a city, or a county is in need of a loan and then it will get a communal loan. We have operating loans, bridging loans, discount credits, Lombard loans, guarantee credit, acceptance credits. And uh, these are all shown here. Again, you can see the, the English is actually quite uh, uh, messy. Um, the differences, you can go through these different types of loans, I think, at home. Um, the differences are usually in maturity. Some of these loans are short term, some of them are long term. Sometimes uh, the difference will only be in collateral. Some of these loans do not have a collateral, some of them have. Uh, some of them are used, for example, if have a bridging or intermediate loan, it's simply to overcome a short term liquidity shortage. If, as a company, Again, as you can see, this is uh, for corporate class, uh, customers and corporate clients. Um, if you have uh, a liquidity shortage and you risk being insolvent and bankrupt, you can ask a bank for a bridging loan. It's not used for investment. It's not used to buy real estate. It's simply used to bridge this lack of liquidity so this is what we call an Überbrückungskredit or a bridging loan. Uh, a discount credit, uh, companies that grant their customers payment terms by making out a bill can exchange that bill prematurely. Uh, operating loans are used for financing raw materials. For example, some companies and some industries, um, they only get um, uh, customer orders from time to time. Take, for example, Airbus and Boeing they will only get an order for a couple of planes every couple of months, sometimes even a couple of years. And if they suddenly get a large order, you can go to a bank and ask the bank for an operating loan because now you know I now have an order to build 10 uh, planes and I need 50 million euros. Then this is of course a different situation compared to a bridging loan where you're uh, just where you just have a liquidity shortage. So this is an operating loan. Um, a Lombard loan is a fixed credit amount provided in sum and secured by pledging movable goods and rights. Overdrafts are granted uh, to which marketable security service collateral. Also effect in Lombard credit, securities lending. Um, these are all different types of loans. Have a look at it and you will see uh, it's important for you to uh, remember the, the types of differences you have between them. Usually in maturity, customers, corporate or retail, and sometimes the uh, intended use of the money, and of course if you have collateral or not. 
guarantee credit, acceptance credit loans, etc. Also investment loans if you want to buy machines. This is uh, not an operating loan, but it's an investment loan. Uh, real credits are used to finance buildings. You could also tell real estate loans. Euro credit loans, it's um, in German Eurokredit. Uh, this is special. Uh, it has nothing to do with the euros. It's simply the name for extremely large loans. So these are usually uh, done with companies with capital requirements totaling several millions of euros in Germany. These are euro credit loans. Common currencies are US dollar, yen, and euro. Promissory note loans, communal loans. Uh, this is, of course, uh, important. Uh, municipalities are, by definition, at least in Germany, 100% uh, uh, risk-free. So there's no need to use a collateral because municipalities always pay back. It's like the Lannisters, they always pay their debts. Yeah? Um, so they have tax revenues. There is no need to collateralization. And this is why it's not a simple operating or investment loan, but banks usually grant special interest rates and special conditions to municipalities, to cities and counties, which makes sense because they, they are risk-free. Mm -hmm. Factoring is something different. Uh, how does factoring work? Same word in German. Factoring, Verträge. Factoring contracts. What is, what is factoring? Yeah? Selling your current receivables. So if I yeah. have a legal claim against someone else, I can sell it. It's yeah. easier Assume that, for example, you are... What should we say? You... You... I'm looking for a good example for an industry that does a lot of factoring. Internet startups. Internet startups, yeah. You get a large number of small receivables and small claims against your customers. And you might enter a factoring contract with a bank. And in this factoring contract, you sell the rights to all these receivables and claims against your customers. And you get a fee. And the danger and the risk that some of them default, the risk is also transferred to the buyer in the factoring contract. Why would you do this? If you are a company selling goods, why would you sell your claims and your receivables to a bank? For example, when I don't have enough people yeah. um, or handling the yeah. receivable process. Yeah. Um, in this case, I just yeah, sell it to a company who specialized in it. Yeah, it's, it's a question of administrative costs. Um, this, is, this is why I was looking for an example for an industry uh, where you have a lot of factoring. For example, it doesn't make sense for, I would say, shoe shop, because all the customers go into the shoe shop and they pay by cash. But as soon as there's a temporal discrepancy between the point of sale and the moment um, the uh, claim is settled, um, the company selling the goods is in risk of its own customers of defaulting. And when you uh, sell a lot of goods and you have a large number of small claims, this might add up. And this could force you out of business if suddenly your average number of defaulting claims is too high. And to minimize this risk, and especially you need people to manage these claims. You need people in your administration to look who has already paid, who is uh, in default. Uh, I have to contact him. Uh, here, first notice, you're in default. Please pay back the 20 euros you owe us. You are, uh, and second, for a good example, for example, take probably Amazon and also, um, some other companies like uh, Otto. It's a large internet shop. Um, they have uh, a shop that is similar to Amazon, but 
you can also buy um, on credit and you will get your bill and the bill will tell you please pay 200 euros within the next two weeks but you've already received the product and in this case if you default Otto will have lost 200 euros and the product and because like, just like Amazon they're selling millions and millions of products each week I guess they have a large number of claims against their customers and they will need a large administration to look at all these claims and to make sure that everyone pays so Otto is extremely large they probably do it on their own but they could tell uh, they could find someone else and to enter a, con a factoring contract then they would simply sell all their claims to the factoring buyer they will get say 98% of the claims so it's a 2% fee and Otto is in the clear and Otto will just say okay we've sold 200 euros and we know we will earn 200 euros less 2% factoring fees but we have no administration costs and we have no problem of someone defaulting on us because it's now the problem of the uh, buyer in the factoring contract and why should the buyer enter such a factoring contract? Because it has synergies from specialization. The, the factoring company will do this for many customers and they will do this for a large number of customers. Okay. This is factoring and you also have a current account or overdraft facilities, of course. All of you have a bank account and you can overdraft your bank account. Uh, you can use money uh, on, from your bank account that the bank has agreed to pay out even though you have no positive balance on your bank account. For a bank this is a loan because it's the short-term version of a loan. Okay, credit card loans same thing, securities lending, um, and this is not as important, I think. You also have consumer or installment loans, consumer or retail loans. I think these are the most important ones. As a private person, you will use um, your overdraft facility on your bank account, you will use a retail loan, or you will get a mortgage loan. A mortgage loan, now we've talked a lot about that, a retail bank loan, what is that? If by chance you're a customer of Banco Santander or Targo Bank or any other bank that is specialized on the retail segment of the banking sector, uh, you might know this. Um, you will get, uh, from time to time you will get a letter and the letter will tell you, are you in need of cash? We will, be, uh, we will be willing to give you a loan, a retail loan of say 10,000 euros for five years at 8% interest rate. No questions asked. We do, don't do uh, credit scoring. Um, we have no system of checking your credit worthiness. Simply take it or leave it. This is the retail segment of the banking sector. Small loans, small because it's up to 30, 40,000 euros maximum. It's mid, mid term uh, and uh, medium term, two, three, five years maybe. And it's, it's quite special because some of these banks, they only deal in mass. Targo Bank, Citibank, at least what's, that's uh, Targo Bank, used to be uh, Citibank, uh, Banco Santander, Santander Bank, they have entered the German banking market uh, with a special focus on retail banking. And they try to attract customers. And um, does this make sense to give out loans without uh, checking the credit worthiness of an uh, applicant? They seem to be making money, so it has to make sense. But how? Um, only when you yield in a high amount of like, contracts, so you minimize the risk. You need to synergize. You need to cut 
back on your administrative costs. They don't, they have actually, they have a quite sophisticated risk management, but they save a lot uh, on money at different points in the administration and they, uh, this is close to what uh, American and US banks did with their ninja loans. They focus on a group um, that is economically weak, not exactly poor, but economically weak, and uh, they simply change the interest rate. I could, uh, for example, if you are my potential customers, I could ask you all for your personal details, your assets, etc., and I could say, okay, you have to pay 1%, you 2 and you 3%. Or I could take an average, or I could also say, I'll take the average plus 0.5%, and I'm in the clear. So the interest rates on these retail loans are usually not very good because you have to pay for the fact that the bank does not do an elaborate risk assessment and it simply deals in mass, in, in large quantities. Okay. Real estate loans, building saving loans, it's all the same. Okay, and for the last part of this lecture. Uh, let me just shortly talk about loan securitization. A bank gives out loans, but a bank will usually also sell off some loans because at some points in, uh, um, in its uh, business cycle, uh, a company, a bank, might decide that it does not want to hold on to certain loans or it might be forced to sell off loans. Why? A loan is a claim on the asset side of the bank, the bank's balance sheet. So it's an asset. And if the bank suddenly has a liquidity shortage or it has a low equity ratio, it might be forced to sell off assets and a bank does not have too, mu too many cars, it does not own too much real estate property, it can only sell securities and sell off loans. And selling of loans is sometimes quite difficult and it can try to securitize loans. In English, this is uh, quite clear. Securitization means the process of making securities out of loans, out of claims against certain assets. In German, the German word is not as clear. In Ge the German word is Verbriefung. Brief is a letter, um, but uh, in... in, in uh, in old German, uh, in former times, uh, securities, uh, stocks, were also called, uh, no, of course, the, the German word is Wertpapiere, and uh, this uh, word Verbriefung reminds, uh, is, is reminiscent of this process of, uh, of forging a letter, a formal document that states the property rights against a company. So, now we speak of Aktien, of stocks and uh, securities, Wertpapiere, and Verbriefung simply is securitization, that is forging a security out of a claim that usually would not be liquid. For example, if I, if you, um, if I owe you five euros, you have a claim against me uh, in the order of five euros, but you cannot transfer it it's actually quite difficult to transfer this right and you need to transfer this claim and you have to draw a formal contract to do this. And of course, transferring a security, a stock or a bond it is much easier. And banks have found a way to securitize loans and if you've uh, um, read something about the financial crisis, you know that there are some upside and downsides uh, to securitization. Um, it usually works like this. Um, we can just skip to this part. Uh, this, is, this is the main slide here, I guess. Um, you do what? Assume I'm a bank. And I have claims against each and every one of you. You are my customers and you have mortgage loans or you have retail loans. And I suddenly want to sell off a certain part. I don't want to be a lender to this part of the class. I want to sell off these loans. 
If I wanted to sell off these loans, I would need to sell all these loans uh, to someone else. I would have to advertise these loans. This doesn't make sense because I would need to give out the information on each and every one of you to potential buyers of these loans. For example, I would uh, ask someone else, um, are you interested in buying a loan um, I gave to you or to you? Now, this is not a not very liquid way of transferring these loans. So what do I do? I open up a special purpose vehicle, which is simply a mailbox company located in a tax-free tax haven. Uh, Bermuda Islands, uh, Guernsey, Jersey, or the, uh, also the Virgin Islands are also quite uh, practical for this. I open a mailbox account, a mailbox company, uh, which is called a special purpose vehicle. Why? Because a special purpose vehicle is a company that has only been opened to act for a special purpose and to, to uh, act as a, a middleman in this construction. I open this special purpose vehicle. In German, it's a Zweckgesellschaft. And I'm the bank. I sell off all these loans to the special purpose vehicle. The special purpose vehicle is now the owner of these loans say, these 10 loans. That is simply something that is done in-house. This is done within the bank. And the special purpose vehicle now has a balance sheet. It says loans. It is now in possession of the loans. And it has paid, say, 10 million euros to the bank. Now, of course, it needs to finance this purchase of the loans, and it needs, it needs to raise 10 million euros uh, in cash. And how does it do this? It issues bonds. It has a very small amount of equity, and it issues uh, bonds. And these bonds are the securities that is sold off to investors. So if you have ever heard of the toxic assets, those the damned ABS and MBS mortgage loans and securities and securitized loans that were sold to investors before the financial crisis. These were bonds from special purpose vehicles that had been originated by some banks. The banks had sold off the loans to a special purpose vehicle and the special purpose vehicle raised capital by issuing bonds and so also equity and selling off equity in bonds to investors. And usually um, this was done with uh, like a waterfall system that there were some bonds uh, that were senior or junior to some other types of bonds. So you, for example, you have a senior tranche, you have um, an equity tranche at the, at the bottom and this meant that if, in the case, some of the loans defaulted, some investors would, be, uh, would get preferential treatment uh, relative to other investors. And investors bought those securities. And under normal circumstances, everyone is happy. The bank is able to raise liquidity and to get liquidity because it is able to sell off the loans. The special purpose vehicle only has one special purpose, saving taxes and enabling the banks to sell off the loans. And the investors can invest in loans. And why are the investors interested in buying the bonds of the special purpose vehicle? Why? It's actually the same as with CDS contracts, credit default swaps. In a credit default swap, I will come to that later on, in a credit default swap, you swap the default risk. Um, why would you be interested in buying the bonds of a special purpose vehicle if I told you you will be investing in loans to the 10, the 10 of you? Why? Because as an investor, and usually these were hedge funds and other banks and insurance companies, these companies, even if they were not a bank, 
and they did not want to become a bank, they were suddenly uh, able to invest in credit risk. Again, remember, giving out loans is nothing else than investing in credit risk. If you buy a security, you accept market risk and you get a return on accepting market risk. In lending, in giving out loans, you are investing in credit risk. You, are, you assume credit risk, you accept credit risk, and you get a return on that risk. But if you want to give a loan, you need an infrastructure for that. You need branches, you need loan officers, you need a risk management, you need a bank. But if you want to invest in credit risk, but do not want the infrastructure that is needed to operate a bank, you could buy these bonds from special purpose vehicles. So investors were quite happy to invest in these bonds. And if done properly, this is actually a nice addition to markets. Okay. We'll continue that next week. Do we have any questions? Okay, then thank you for your attention and see you next week. Thank you.